And I don't know where Bassam is. Do we have a closed session tonight? No, we do not. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, do I have, I got me, Chris, Rebecca, Bob, Linda, okay, I got four, we can start. All right, we'll call the uh, meeting to order at 5.30. Trustee Sandoval, could you lead us in the pledge, please? Yes, uh, please stand, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, of America. and, to the, and to the republic for which it, for stands. Which it stands, one nation, one nation. Under God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty, liberty just justice for all. May be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Sandoval. Um, can I introduce themselves? Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul. I'm the Spanish interpreter. Buenas tardes todos. Mi nombre es Paul. Soy el intérprete de español y estoy en la línea de español. Good evening, everyone. This is Oliver Thor, the multiper. Yo no quiero Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, next up, item A3, opportunity for the board to adjust the public. Uh, Clerk Alcar, I know you just got on the meeting. Are you ready with the comments or do you want me to take them? I am ready. Perfect, there we go. Thank you, sir. I know we have some that are for this one and we have some for some agenda items. Yes, just uh, give me a quick second. Okay. C five one, C three one. Um, should I read them in order? Okay, good evening. 363 days ago, I stood in front of this board and asked that a parent advisory committee be formed. Um, the district responded by creating a pack that had no announcement and parents were not told how they might apply to participate, but instead invited the principals to bring individuals from their school site councils to form PAC. The district held private meetings with no announcement to the public on how we might attend these meetings. This is not transparent. This year, while things are different, the ways to keep caregivers from being more involved have not changed. I want to know when will parents truly be asked to be partners instead of simply show up and go through the motions. Since the district and the board feel that parent engagement needs to be exclusive and participants are invite only, I'm asking that you more trans uh, be more transparent and let the public know what is done at these invitation only events, what goals are being met, what is it, what is it achieving for our scholars and community? Thank you, Maria Elena Sepulveda. Okay, next one. Good evening. Uh, we have questions regarding the board and district, district's commitment to accountability and quality uh, community engagement. We believe we have witnessed actions taken by the district that misleads the board and this contributes to a divide between all stakeholders and community members. Last year, this district discussed school closures and consolidations. Last year, this board voted against sheltering women and children. Last year, this board moved against community members to become business owners. And last year, this board had a member whose immediate family members showed up to, private, to a private residence of a community member when she came before the board to declare that the specific board member was pushing um, their resolution as a personal matter. The district was provided with proof that this trustee was acting with malice in um, their position. After that individual continued to advocate for the public to use the district's resolution and resources to hinder that individual even after they were no longer serving the board. This is all documented and since last year we have not had an outcap because of the pandemic and now our plan for the next four years is being drafted and the district has done nothing to be to be accountable to the commitments of the, of the current plan, which includes, public, uh, which includes student safety. The district has lost students, and while they may claim they do not know why they are losing students and families, have stated clearly safety was a concern. 
How can we uh, prevent our students from being bullies when this board condones, protects, and behaves like bullies? Thank you, Padres Organized Community. And let's see, this was already read. Okay. Yep, we're done with this section. All right, thank you, Trustee Alcar. Can I have the agenda back up online, please? And I know there's a couple of consent agenda items, Trustee O'Carr, I believe. Um, but next on the item is and the agenda is B1, personal recommendations. Can I have a motion? I'll move it. Can I have a second? Second, Sandoval. Thank you, Trustee Sandoval. Move by, move by Baker, second by Sandoval. Trustee Sandoval. Yes. Bastion. Yes. Revis. He's absent. Ba Baker. Aye. Fowler. Aye. Elkars and I. Jefferson. Aye. The ayes have it. Six zero zero with one absent. Thank you. Next up on the agenda item is C consent agenda item. Trustee Elkar, do we have any comment cards on any consent agenda items? Uh, we do. All right. The first comment. Um, after reviewing the attachments, good evening. After reviewing the attachments for this item, I have questions. There are campuses sitting empty even when COVID isn't keeping our students out of schools. And now the board wants to go in uh, with a development company and requesting bonds from the city. The same city you all, you all told last year you didn't want any shelters near your site because it was a safety concern. Now you're going to go to the same policymakers and ask them to grant bonds to build this new school while students in some of our oldest sites are in need of renovations to restrooms and more. The school isn't built yet, but these students were already being centered last year when we were discussing school closures and consolidations. The school was given priority because of its uh, potential to bring in new students, but has the board done anything to reduce the loss of students currently with, with the district? This board has been disrespectful to local government and some of our most vulnerable community members, but now you want the people to help fund a new building for potential students while you continue to ignore and neglect our most vulnerable citizens, the students presently in your hands. Thank you, Maria Elena Svoboda. And then the last one is uh, C.5. Okay. Um, good evening. After reviewing the memorandum for the MOU on the surface, everything looks fine. However, the state of California passed the law in 1994 allowing children as young as 12 to give consent to receive medical care. A year ago, this board signed a resolution opposing children having access to a legal substance. They need to be on, they need to be of a certain age to access and that resolution passed. Today, you are proposing putting healthcare centers on campuses through May to administer vaccines to staff. And I wonder, will it be extended? And if so, how? It's concerning considering not all parents know that their children can give consent at the age of 12. According to the California Department of Health, with regards to consent to immunization, the, I, I quote, uh, quote, there are no federal or California state requirements for informed consent specifically related to immunization. Federal law requires that healthcare staff provide a vaccine information statement to a patient, parent, or legal representative before each dose of certain vaccines. California law permits minors 12 years and older to consent to confidential medical services for the prevention of sexually transmitted diseases, without parental consent. It's also concerning having engaged the community regarding this, this vaccine and, other, and others and vaccine injuries, will we have assurances that our students will not be able to consent to a vaccine that has too little science and research behind it to be worth a few benefits of weakening symptoms when the side effects are being reported from mild to death? I understand the desire to return to normal and to ensure that all precautions are taken to see that happens, but I also want to be sure we're not leaving our children vulnerable to actual harm. We're now giving students access to put substances in the, in, to their bodies that they do not understand and that turn a profit for others. This feels like exploitation and, and, and experimentation waiting to, waiting to take place on vulnerable, vulnerable communities. Meanwhile, the district does nothing to denounce or discourage activities of those associated with or claiming association with the board who have continuously engaged in activity that violates public health orders since March of 2020. Thank you, Trustee Okara. Was that the last one? 
And that is the last one. All right, perfect. Does any trustees have any comments or want any consent agenda item pulled set for a separate vote? No, I, before we move this, I, I don't want something moved. I just want um, uh, the, Connor, can you scroll down a little bit, please? Which one is the vaccine? Um, the, as we start to move into that, to that vaccine trend, I hope that we are, and I know we will, that um, we'll see, you know, some, some stakeholders involved on that, how we're going to do that, how we're going to administer those vaccines as we get a little, a little closer community and our bargaining units and so on and so forth. I trust we're going to do that. All right. Any other questions or comments from the board? Mr. Vice right. Chairman. I'm sorry, Mr. Bastion. Mr. Vice President, I'll move the item. Okay. Thank you. Can I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. All right. Mo uh, moved by Bastion, seconded by Fowler. Uh, Trustee Sandoval. Trustee yes. Sandoval. Yes. Bastion. Yes. Uh, Revis is absent. Uh, Baker. Aye. Fowler. Aye. El Carzen I. Jefferson. Aye. And the ayes have it six zero zero with one absent. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Next up is the board workshop, and I believe that that is uh, Dr. Coates and your staff. Yes. And before we get into um, the budget workshop, Kate Ingers, our executive director of fiscal service is going to uh, present our independent financial audit report. Hello, everyone. Um, we have with us today um, Aspen Cloud Hall. She is the senior manager for um, Gilbert Accountancy. And so I'm going to uh, share the screen and um, have her do a quick overview of how our audit went. All righty, Aspen. All right, thanks, Kate. Um, hello, thank you for having me. As Kate uh, noted, I'll just be presenting um, just the cliff notes of how the audit went, just the summary of the scope and the results of the audit. Um, before I go into that, though, I do want to note just how um, COVID impacted the audit last year. Generally, um, we're on site a few different times during the year. and We look at multiple stacks of things, and we're at different school sites where we look at more support. And once it became evident that it wasn't safe for us to go out to our site visit, visits, um, Kate and Leslie and their team just really drill down to make sure we got everything that we needed and um, people at different school sites scanned everything over to us and included three federal programs. So it was no small undertaking for Kate and her team. So I just wanted to know just how much work went into, um, you know, just the finance team with making sure the audit went out without a hitch. And I just, we were so appreciative of that. So I just wanted to note just everything that went into that on top of everything else that they were already dealing with. So with that out of the way, um, Kate's going to drive, so uh, if you want to scroll to the next page, Kate. Working down to page two. Okay. There we go. Okay, so we out of the financial statements for the district as of June 30th, 2020. Um, and this page just kind of summarizes everyone's role during the audit. The management is responsible for preparing the financial statements and we were engaged as auditors to um, provide an opinion on whether they were prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Um, we did perform our audit using um, government auditing standards. And you can see on the right, we issued an unmodified opinion or a clean opinion. That's the best you can get. And then to the next page, Kate, if you don't mind. Um, this page just kind of talks about some of the qualitative aspects of the accounting practices that the district uses, 
if you were to browse through all 90 pages of the report, you would see um, note one discusses the accounting policies that the district has adopted and uses. And then the next um, box down, it discusses um, that management does make some judgments and estimates when preparing their financial statements. As part of the audit, we evaluate whether those are appropriate and we found them to be reasonable. Um, some of the significant estimates for the district are related to their capital assets, the useful life that they assign to those, and then also the liabilities for their pension and their other post-employment benefit liabilities. If you want to look more into that, each one of those has a footnote that you can kind of um, delve into if you're inclined to do that. On to the next page. This, um, this page just discusses our interaction with management. I'll just hit a couple of highlights here. I know someone's trying to go skiing, so I'm trying to stay brief here. Um, as far as the plan scope and timing, even with COVID, we were able to complete our audit as we agreed upon at the beginning of the engagement. We had no disagreements with management and no difficulties um, were encountered during the audit. As I noted before, Kate and her team went above and beyond to make sure we we're able to review everything we needed to as we would have if we were able to go to the sites. On to the next page. This just discusses audit findings and any um, misstatements noted. There was one um, state compliance finding that was noted this year related to the district's um, percentage for classroom teacher salaries. They're just slightly under the required 55% that's required for those expenditures. Um, the district did receive their waiver from the County Office of Education. So there's no financial impact related to that for the district. There was one proposed entry that we made as part of um, the district's accounting for some of the debt refundings that occurred this year. And those were to the government wide financial statements, not the fund based statements and management determined that it was um, that they weren't significant to the financial statements and we agreed with passing on those entries. And the last page just discusses some of the supplementary information that's included in the report. Um, government auditing or government accounting standards require some require supplementary information that are um, detailed in the table of contents. And with our federal and state compliance procedures, there's some additional supplementary information that's also detailed and more information um, in the table of contents. And that is really all the points that um, I had to address with everybody. If you have any questions, I'm happy to go over anything in more detail. Any questions or comments from the board? Just overall, just clean audit. They're very well prepared. And we're, as I said before, we're just very appreciative of all the work that they did to make sure we were able to um, do everything we needed to. And the state extended the reporting deadline and the district still met the original deadline, which not a lot of them, some of them opted not to do that, even though you know they have a pass to go two extra months. So really it's just a lot about the, the finance team. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? So with other districts, this is Trustee Sandoval. So other districts didn't take the time or? There were some that, um, we had some that just, you know, I think with having a little extra time, they just took a little extra time to get things done. Um, so yeah, we have some that still aren't issued um, just for various reasons, but they have, you know, everyone has a little bit more time still, but um, yeah, not everyone shopped for a 1215 still this year. Okay. They didn't have Thank to, you. but um, but some did. So, and Twin Rivers was one of those. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Sandoval. Trustee Bastion. Mr. Vice President, I think Kate Ingersoll and her team has done a great job. Keep it up, and I accept this report with pride. Congratulations. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? All right, Dr. Coates. All right, we do need a motion on this um, to accept this audit report before we move on. Okay, can I have a motion from the board? Mr. Vice President, I move, move take action on it. Thank you, Trustee Bastion. Can I have a second? I'll second it. All right, moved by Bastion, seconded by, by Baker. Uh, Trustee Sandoval. Yes. Trustee Sandoval. Yes. Um, Bastion. Aye. Rebus is absent. Uh, Baker. Aye. Fowler. For personal reasons, I must abstain. Um, Elkaraz and I. Jefferson. Aye. All right, the ayes have it. Six, uh, sorry, five, 
zero one with one absent. Um, I am of the understanding that if someone abstains, it isn't um, enough to say for personal reasons. Can you uh, articulate as to why you cannot vote for this audit report, Trustee Fowler? Because it's the situation that occurred many years ago and I can't go into it for personal reasons. Okay. If you want, I can I can tell you on the outside, but not for public record. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, item B two. All right, I'm Vice President Baker, uh, Dr. Pena's staff, uh, trustees, and the public. Uh, Kate and I are excited to be here at the annual budget workshop. Uh, Again, this happens every, oh, Kate, do you mind presenting? Are you driving this one? I just jumped, I was so excited, I just jumped right in. So every year in January, the governor puts forward a proposal and it is just that, it is a proposal uh, subject to change. Um, what's going on right now or Senate hearings uh, regarding the discussing the proposal and if you recall last year we had the um, most volatile changes that we've ever seen so um, so we're going to discuss the budget or the governor's proposal and what it means for Twin Rivers. Um, the next two slides are all of the acronyms. So often we say there's alphabet soup in education. And so these are just references. We're not gonna go through all of them, but they're there for, for you um, to refer back to. So today we're gonna go, as I've mentioned, the governor's um, uh, proposal, pandemic funding is a major part. COVID uh, was a major focus um, in the proposal what the impact to Twin Rivers is, what our next steps are, and then looking forward with multi-year projections. So getting right into it with the governor's proposal, um, moving into the next slide, just from a national level, um, with the economic outlook, the overall theme for the budget this year, both nationally and statewide, is COVID-19. It's just playing part in the budget. Um, so what you'll see over the next few slides is that we do have recovery, uh, which is good. But um, unlike the recession back in 2000 and 2008, not everyone is recovering at the same rate. And, and you'll see that. Um, so the impacts to uh, unemployment, you can see at the worst part of, um, of this recession, in that red line, it drops down to almost 15%. And you can see that um, arrow where, it, where we are now, we haven't really recovered. Uh, that black line is the recession back in 2007, 2008. Um, and there is projections that that's still gonna take years uh, to recover. Um, what we've learned about this though is one, that employment is the big driver. Uh, in both our state and our, our national uh, economy. Uh, and when people work, or because when people work, they pay taxes and they buy stuff and um, they're paying sales tax. So we haven't recovered yet, but we are um, on that mend. And what this uh, slide is indicating is the jobs by wage se uh, sector. And so you can really see the um, broad difference that blue line is high wage sectors, um, where lower wage sectors are that, that red line. So you can see the gap between um, and uh, the evenness of the loss. So it really is those high wage sectors that are uh, causing the recovery uh, so quickly. But, and as I had mentioned in the previous slides that um, it's not impacting Californians in the same way. So. Um, if you have a high wage job, it hasn't really affected you too much. Um, if you are, have a lower wage job, you've really experienced some, some major impacts and haven't experienced the recovery quite, um, quite in the same way. 
all of that leads to um, our three big revenues, which Kate is going to go in and start talking about some of the revenues for uh, the state. Oh, I was, but the button I was using to go forward isn't working anymore. <laughs> um, so let's. My question is, how close is Connor? Because my entire keyboard is not working. Here, let me... So I sent a request so I can control it. If you could hit allow. I have it ready to go too, so I can. Let me know which slide. Next one. Is. The next one. Okay. Perfect. So weird. All right. Moving forward. <laughs> so um, in the state of California, there are um, three big revenue sources that run the, that help run the state. It's personal income taxes. You see here in red, the largest. It's also sales use tax and corporation tax. As Kristen mentioned, there are certain um, selected industries and or people that have been hit by the pandemic, um, but there's others that have not. And in fact, there are some that have grown like Tesla and Etsy and PayPal. And so we're actually seeing increases um, over the small increases over the next two years um, in state revenue that originally had been anticipated. On the next slide, This is the overarching of, um, of the state and the total available resources or revenue increases 1.48% in 21-22 and that's to the 170 billion. But then the expenditures increase by 5.53% compared to the previous year and that total is 164 billion. So there still is um, an addition to add to the state's ending fund balance of 4 billion, uh, sorry, 6 billion. So at the very, very bottom, um, the state is able to increase the rainy day fund um, going from 12.5 million to 15.5. Next slide. Um, here are the projections of the shortfall in the future. Um, although um, we're looking at a larger increase for next year, 21, 22, um, the projections are, are looking uh, for not as much in the future years. Next slide. Um, so what this here is the Proposition 98. Hey, may, may I interrupt and go back yeah. to that slide, previous slide, please? Sure. That is Rebecca. Um, okay, so... We show 15 on 20, 21, 22, and then 22, 23. Is that a negative? Yes, into 22, 23. Keep in mind, this is the state budget. This is not Twin Rivers. Budget. Okay. Okay. Thank you. It's just giving us an idea of what to expect um, for future revenues from the state. And not to say that we're going to get a negative, because we're not expecting that. We just won't get as much as um, we're anticipated to receive for next year. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Kate, what I would add, Kate, I would add to that is the state does multi-year projections as, as well. And so really when you look at these from 1920 to 2021, that we're in the positive, but when you look at those out years, they're really accounting for the risks and unknowns. Uh, we don't know what that's gonna look like. And um, it speaks to the slide that our risk um, contributing to the rainy day fund and building their reserves again. So the next slide here is um, Proposition 98 funding for um, school districts and, and higher education. 
and it has been um, slowly increasing over the last few years. And again, this was a surprise um, to see this increase for 21, 22, but because of increasing state revenues, um, this has happened, is anticipated to happen. So next slide. You can see here that um, in 2021, in the box down at the bottom, the statutory COLA was 2.31%, but school districts were funded 0%. So we had a 0% increase on our LCFF or categorical and categorical fundings in this year. Next year, the statutory COLA from the state is 1.5%. However, on LCFF funding only, we are going to receive 3.84%. And this is their way of um, kind of compensating for what we didn't receive in 2021, difference between the statutory COLA and the funded COLA. But do keep in mind that this um, additional increase of 3.84 is only on LCFF. It's not on special ed, it's not on the mandate of law grant, it's not on any other categories. So next slide. This is kind of, um, Reiterating here, we have the Department of Finance and their estimates. We have school services estimates. And in 21 22, as we've talked about, the total is 3.84% for LCFF funding. School services is projecting a 1.28% increase the following year and a 1.61% increase the year after that, which is what you will see in the multi year projections on the second interim budget reports. Moving over to deferrals, um, the 2021 budget includes almost 13 billion in K-12 LCFF funding deferrals. So that's this year. What's being proposed is for um, is to eliminate those deferrals, or most of them, but that will not happen until 21-22. So we will see deferrals, cash deferrals in this year. Um, ultimately, we do get the money. This is a cash flow um, issue that needs to be um, reviewed and we'll have some more information on that in a couple more slides. But the proposal is to have a, a very limited um, deferral from June to July in the next year. Next slide. Special education. So currently, uh, special education is $625 per student. Um, this will receive a 1.5% increase, not the larger percentage, which will bring it up to $634.38. Next slide. There were other items from the state. Um, but there's still, we still need more information on them. Not enough detail out, out yet, but um, they're proposing funding for community schools, mental health programs, school climate surveys. And then on the next slide, also for educational professional development being proposed um, 90 million of one time funding going to school districts. And then on the next slide, we have um, how PERS percentages and where we're at right now for those. So if you look to the far right, and if you look at 2021, which is 20.70%, um, that's what Twin Rivers is paying for um, on behalf of all um, classified employees. Uh, for their future retirement. The state is requiring an additional 2.30% for all districts to pay. So we will be up to 23%. And then you can also see um, that it continues to, to grow. On the next slide, we have CalSTRS, so this is the certificated retirement. If you look on the very bottom right hand corner, um, there's actually anticipated to be a small decrease. So um, 
0.23% for next year. So going from the 16.15% of the school district's pay on behalf down to 15.92%. Okay, and as we had mentioned, COVID-19 was a big theme and, and the major impact. We just included pandemic funding in its own section, just similar to uh, what School Services of California did as well. Go ahead and move to the next slide. So between the state and the federal government, can we go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, there was one-time funding to meet the needs of the time. So these are the different funding sources. Uh, we had the elementary and secondary school emergency relief, known as ESSER. We had the government emergency education relief, known as GEAR, and then uh, coronavirus relief fund. Um, we also had the Senate Bill 117 and Proposition 98. Uh, you can see that um, the Proposition 98 is just our typical education funding. And, and so it's just something to note that total is uh, 540 million. When you start to take a look at the one-time funds that came in, how significant that funding was, that one-time funding was to the, um, the state of California, well over what we typically get for just our regular Prop 98. So when we take a look at those slides, go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, slide here. It's just a different way to look at the exact same information. Uh, from the top of the pyramid to the bottom are the most restrictive funds. And it's restrictive by the time you had to spend those funds. So the learning loss mitigation, the LL funds, uh, <laughs> initially, the date has actually changed. Initially, those needed to be spent by December 30th of 2019. Uh, it right before that deadline hit, uh, I think it was December 27th, they extended the, the deadline and now the new proposed date is May 31st. You can see um, on the left of your screen that uh, Twin Rivers was allocated and how much we've spent of that. We weren't waiting until um, there was maybe some legislation move to uh, extend the deadline. So we um, were really methodical about how we spent those funds. Um, and you can see that uh, the SB 117 at the very bottom is the most unrestricted. Uh, and so we do still have some, um, some funds to exhaust. Same with the uh, ESSER 1. And these were all the funds that came out early in March, the early set of the pandemic. In addition to these yeah, funds, um, of course. another thing to note there is um, under the spent and encumbered on the right hand side, um, to date that 66% um, of these expenditures have gone to um, instructional and 3% to general administration and then 31% to facilities. Really focused on that learning loss. Thank okay. um, Wasn't a certain portion at this ES SER1 also for to pay police salaries? Am I understanding that correctly? That is correct. Um, it's be considered it's, administration. Yeah. It's in. Um, yes. Yes. In administration. Yes, okay. I, I just try to visualize their function code. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in general administration. Okay, so we use the COVID funds for police salaries under the ESSER one. Correct. Thank you. All right. Go ahead to the next slide, please. Uh, so in addition to the CARES funds, we um, did see an increase for child nutrition reimbursements, an additional 75 cents per meal. Um, Twin Rivers was eligible. And um, so what that meant for Twin Rivers was an additional $112.2 million for meal reimbursement, which is... So... 
So there's a new COVID stimulus package that was just passed on December 27th of 2020, uh, 1.3 trillion of consolidated appropriations, um, larger than what we had seen in um, the original package. So um, that was 82 billion total for education, another 7 billion to expand broadband access, 10 billion for childcare, um, and then continued funding for uh, school programs. Um, we're still getting information here. Go ahead and move to the next slide. So you can see of that, most of that went into the ESSER funds. Again, uh, California's share of that is 6.8 billion. And the way that is proposed to be allocated is for Title I uh, districts um, through those funding sources. So Twin Rivers will see um, uh, again, some one-time funds to uh, support the efforts uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, one thing to note on that before we move on is um, of that 6.8 billion, um, a, a large portion this time will be uh, set aside for private schools, which didn't happen in that first round. Mm -hmm. So there is um, a proposal on the table for the reopening of schools. Um, this is $2 billion in one-time proposition 98 funds uh, to assist in the safe reopening and operation. Um, there are strings attached to these, um, to these dollars um, for districts who, um, who meet the criteria uh, if they were to reopen in February, then um, for TK2, the earliest grades, they'd have an additional $450 per student. That's on total ADA, not just the, um, those smaller, the small band of grade levels. Um, if, they, if districts hit a March reopening and can meet the criteria of the state, um, that goes down slightly to $337.50. Um, those are the baselines for districts with um, a high level of um, poverty or English learners or, or foster youth um, that could go upwards into um, up to $700. Um, so again, it's based on total ADA. Some of the criteria that goes with it is a, a approved and adopted COVID safety plan, an approved labor agreement, offering in-person instruction, uh, COVID testing that is aligned with the cadence of the state for both staff and, and students, um, and then a technology certification to show that um, students have access to technology and Wi-Fi. Uh, so in addition to, um, to what we've already discussed, there are proposals on the table for expanded learning time and academic intervention grants. Um, targeting low income, English learner, foster youth, and homeless. Um, this is really to mitigate that learning loss that has occurred as a result of the pandemic. Uh, the, the impact to term, twin is 28, $21.8 million. Now, what this proposal means for Twin Rovers overall. First, we're going to start um, with the cash flow and, and deferrals that I touched upon um, with the governor's proposal. And so, really, the focus is that um, we still will have these February through June deferrals in this fiscal year. Um, but the proposal is that we will have very minimal only June to July for the next fiscal year. So that would then make this only um, a one-time referral for the February through May. On the next slide, here is the percentages that we're talking about of these cash referrals. So normally in February, we get 90% of our LCFF funding. Um, however, they, they um, for 2021, they will be deferring 53%. So we will only receive 4.23%. And you can see those percentages get bigger and we get um, less. 
Um, it's not that we're not going to get the money. We will get it. They're just deferring them to later months. So cash reserve is super important during this time. Um, you know, and or those that did not have enough reserve need to um, obtain a tax revenue anticipation note. Um, we have projected that we will keep our cash positive over these um, next five, six months, and that we do not need big trends. On the next slide, um, so different um, item here from the state that we didn't talk about yet is the Proposi Proposition 98 Reserve Deposit. And so when voters passed Proposition 2, the state created a PSSSA that requires the state to make a deposit in the education legal fund when four conditions are met. And so it is, um, it is projected that all these conditions are going to be met for next year. And so then on the next slide, what this Proposition 2 also did was that it created a policy tying this deposit to the maximum amount that school districts could maintain in their reserves. Um, this was a very big thing when it came to be, um, you know, limiting schools um, reserves is, um, is a concern that to all school districts, but we never thought <laughs> that all the criteria would be met. And that this would happen. Um, but here we anticipate um, that with this deposit, that this is going to trigger the cap on district reserves in the 22 23 year. And it's going to limit it to 10% of the assigned and unassigned general fund balances. So on the next slide, um, as I said, you know, requiring limited reserves it is a concern for all school districts. Um, you know, reserves provide schools with um, the ability to be more strategic and reducing expenditures when faced with a crisis. Um, you know, these reserves protect students, employees, and the public. The current state financial projections show um, a deficit beginning in 22-23 and so then to add this um, restriction of reserve on, on top of it, um, it is a great concern and it will not be um, equipped to be able to, um, to work through the reductions in, in the years to come. So on the next um, slide, this just shows the reserve and this current data we have is 1819, so this is uh, California. The average reserve is 17.26% for unified. And this um, requirement is going to um, limit it to only 10%. Elementary is like 20.47%, and high schools have 15.64%. Um, you know, local agent, um, agencies, school districts, um, you know, who have these larger reserves, um, they're more prepared. For recessions, are more prepared in how the next year to think about things um, before implementing. On the next slide, as we mentioned, um, we anticipate this will be triggered. It affects 22 uh, limits um, the unassigned and assigned to 10% in the general fund and the special reserve fund for other than. Outlay, which is fund 17. It also requires the state superintendent of public instruction to notify districts and county offices when they are met and when they are no longer met. Next slide. All right. So uh, this is not new information. Twin Rivers is a declining enrollment district. And um, the state does have a, a measure in place to help districts like Twin Rivers so they don't face a harsh cliff in that decline. Um, important to note that declining enrollment funding, it really just delays uh, what's going to happen. And so it's important to just make good um, 
uh, fiscal decisions, all of these funds that we've talked about this evening are all one-time funds, not ongoing. Important to um, just keep saying that because um, our compensation increases over time with, with step and column and staffing. Um, so, so we just always have to keep the idea of, of what the impact of a declining enrollment means. So taking a look at this next slide on um, where the decline for Twin Rivers is, you've seen this slide multiple times throughout the course of the year. And what I would um, just revisit quickly here is taking a look at the far left of the bar chart, looking at kinder and, and grade one. So the yellow bar is uh, our current year, 2021. You can see how much lower that is than the blue bar or any of the other colors. Those are the, uh, the students in our earliest grades that will go through the entire 12 years in Twin Rivers. And so we can see that we're gonna have a decline that will impact Twin Rivers for the next 13 years. Um, and, and while it happens in other grade levels as well, um, we're most concerned about those early grades, um, that K and one. Next slide. So here is, here is the impact ADA. So you can see in 1920, um, we were funded, uh, fully funded. In 2021, we had a, a hold harmless and we were funded based on our 1920 uh, ADA. In 2021, we're no longer held harmless, but because of the measure that the state has in place, we still get um, that reprieve. So we are held, uh, uh, funded at 1920 level. But in 2022-23, uh, we're going to be funded based on the 2021-2022 level. And you can see that's going to be a major cliff for Twin Rivers. And so um, while we have access to one-time funds now, um, we, as Kate will show in, in the multi-years, that we have to be planning for the future. So here's another way to look at this. Um, information, the green is our enrollment. The blue is the actual P2 ADA. And then the red is what we were funded on. And so you can see in, in 1718 that um, our, our actual P2 ADA was the same that we were funded on. But then in 1819, when we declined and the actual the blue declined, um, we still receive a higher amount. This happens again in 1920. 2021 is in yellow because we're not doing ADA this year. And so this is where it, this is where we projected that it would be if, if we were um, recording the ADA to the state. And so you can see that it's a big um, decline but we're being funded way up high on the red. Going into 21, 22, the blue, the actual is pretty similar, a little less and then the, then the current year, which had a huge decline. And then in, um, and then with the red, um, we're funded less than last year, but more than our actual students. So in 22, 23, this is the cliff. Look at the, the red is where we're funded. Look at that big drop. So this is where we're being funded on the students. Go ahead. This is Rebecca. Could you explain to me what you say not including SCOE? Could you explain to me if it's not including SCOE, is, is SCOE included in this? Or? So we have about um, 90, 90 ADA of um, programs that the Sacramento County Office of Education runs. Um, and they run the programs, they take the attendance. Um, there are students from our area, but, um, but then, but the state records it in the RP2 ADA. Okay. So okay. It, it, it's the, um, mainly the higher and uh, special education. Um, Kate, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, that that chart that you just put up um, it, on declining enrollment, um, and it was, um, and you were talking about the kinder and and how the enrollment dropped. 
what's going on with the high school? I mean, that's way, way down. I mean, what is the district doing to... Um... So actually, if, if you look, go ahead and go back, Connor, about maybe three or four slides. If you look yeah. closely, there's stuff. So if you look closely, yellow is the current year. So let's look at ninth grade. Look how high ninth grade is compared to the last year, the year before that, or the year before that. So we've actually grown in secondary in all okay. grades um, compared to the last three years. Yeah. Okay. So do we know where, what's going on with this? And why, why is our, our decline? What, what is going on with that? Is it different? Christy Jefferson, I would say that the kinder decline was a statewide trend. It's not just okay. this year and largely due to the pandemic and what what is unknown right now is will where will those students show up in 21 22 and so it it certainly is not a um, isolated twin rivers thing we're going to be concerned and we're bringing it to the attention in case they show back up next year uh, okay. it's important to know but but there's um, been a lot of publication throughout the state that um, this has been a, a trend Okay. All right. I, I'm, I'm concerned about the high school uh, trend. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Yes. So on, on that one uh, for, for high schools. Um, so if we had uh, uh, ENIC um, or whatever it will be called in the, in the future, um, that would help tremendously bring up the high school numbers, correct? Yeah. It's all those all development in the in the Thomas area is going to help generate those ninth through 12th grade students. Um, that would certainly, and, and even seventh through 12th grade. Yeah, it takes the development of the houses to have your students in to bring up the enrollment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Perfect. So on this slide here, um, so what's the effect to Twin Rivers LCFF local control funding formula revenue? It's our, our main revenue source. So using the January um, governor's proposal, which is a 3.84% increase, we do have a funded decrease on ADA of 233, and then our unduplicated people percentage that we're using is 89.78%. So under these conditions, we are looking at a 6.6 .6 million increase in LCFF funding, 4.0 million is base funding, and 1.7 million is supplemental concentration funding. So on the next, um, we'll, we'll do one more slide here on, on revenue. And then after that, we're gonna be looking at the automatic expenditures that happen. And then we're going to take all the pieces and put it together and, and look at it on one slide with the new revenue coming in versus automatic expenditures that happen. So um, this is um, really um, school district revenue sources. Down at the bottom, we have the dollar amounts in for our um, first interim budget. And so our LCFF base funding, which is the most unrestricted, is about 214 million. The LCFF supplemental concentration funding, which is targeted funding, and you can see all these things here that we do with that funding, um, visual and performing arts, activity directors, additional counselors, additional VPs, engagement, um, behavior intervention, uh, facilities and some custodial, class size reduction, learning duty, career and tech ed, English learner programs, and more. <laughs> so this is all the stuff in, in, in our LCAP. Um, so noted that we don't have one this year. <laughs> However, everything except for one program has all been reported this year and we've still been following the same um, programs. So 71.5 million. Uh, in supplemental concentration. Then we have federal revenue, which is the most restrictive. And then we have state revenue and local revenue. So now we'll move on to our expenditures on the next slide. So automatic increase cost is um, the step in column for each year. And so um, 
you know, during these workshops, instead of just showing you $2.7 million, um, we like to show you where we get the information from and how we're calculating the projection. And, and specifically, this is only the general fund, and this is only unrestricted. Um, so if you put in nutrition services, adult education, early childhood education, this would be more. If we added in the restricted funds, um, the, the title, the title, anybody funded out of the title funds, the federal funds, this is, um, so this is the unrestricted general fund. For certificated, uh, the step increase is typically about 1.4%. The unrestricted projected salary is um, 111 million. We take out subs and stipends because those would not receive a step column increase. And so we're down to 103 million. And when we apply the 1.4%, it is 1.4, almost 1.5 million for um, automatic increases um, projected for next year for certificated. Um, classified 761,000. Such great benefits for all of the above, half a million. So you're looking at 2.7 million um, for an automatic expenditure increase. Next slide. Um, there are two restricted programs, um, but the unrestricted needs to make an additional contribution to. And that would be a routine restricted maintenance count and our special ed. Um, those costs of step and column is about 438,000. So that brings that total to 3.1 million per step column. On the next slide, um, this really varies year to year, the squares and curves. Very exciting. And what's also made it very helpful to our budget is we have a point. 3% decrease anticipated um, for districts to pay to SPURS. And so it's a 256,000 decrease. However, the SPURS is going up 2.30%. So there's an additional 800,000 to pay. So that nets out to 550,000 more for next year. Um, even though it's an increase, it's um, much smaller than it's been, um, not last year, but the few years before what, when both programs are, um, are increasing. On the next slide, this is a overarching. We'll talk about compelled numbers in, in a little bit, but to the far left, it's 2021. You can see there, there's no revenue because we didn't get a full increase. So this is all about growth, growth in revenue and growth in expenditures and all the things we just talked about. So there was no full increase in 2021, but yet, um, so the stars actually went down. So you'll see it's below the zero. Um, we have our step in column, we have PERS increase, we have special ed increases, and then we gave a, um, we gave that one time compensation increase. If we move into 21, 22, so please note that the second yellow box is 2% one time. That is actually ongoing. That is my oversight. So in 21, 22, with that 3.84%, we're looking at about $172 um, per ADA increase from the second one concentration from the base that we just looked at. But then we still have all these expenditures to the right hand side that are automatically going to happen. And you can see that those are more than the revenue coming in. Um, even though it's more, it's a smaller gap than when we go into the 22, 23 year, which is our fifth year. And you can see how minimal the revenue is and how large the expenditures are anticipated to be. On the next slide, well, thank you. Um, so just cost of 1%, um, again, very important number since um, salaries and benefits are the largest part of our budget. So you can see here by bargaining units and then all these and all other certificated and classified um, what the cost of 1% is on the, the very bottom. So um, 
through is 1.4, so it's really about half a million and continues. So a total of 2.2 million. Uh, again, this is just the general fund, it doesn't include adult ed or early um, childhood education. On the next slide, we take um, the 1% salary increase and just put in the big part so you can kind of see um, where the costs go on the cost of 1%. And then the next slide, so another piece to the overarching or multi-year projections and planning is, um, you know, what's student enrollment for next year and this decrease? Well, how does that affect teachers? How does it affect staffing in schools? How does it affect, um, you know, the staffing formula, the staffing formula book that was recently approved by the board? Um, so what we have here is we're anticipating between this year and next year, because this year we had a big decline that we weren't expecting. And then next year's decline, when we put them together, it's a 724 student decline um, compared to how we're staffed currently. So if we say a class size is 28, so we divide 28 by 274 students, that's 26 FTEs, 26 full time equivalent teaching positions. Oh, we know the 724 students do not come in these perfect packages by grade, by location. Um, so a more reasonable assumption is 15 less um, FTE with an average salary um, and benefits of 117,000. We're looking at almost 1.8 million. Um, that will be a um, reduction to salaries between members. And so on the next slide, this is where, almost where, we're going to call the pieces together. So this one, this slide was presented at first in run. This is the, the 21-22 projection budget at 21-21 first in run, which was in December. So at that time, there was no um, LCFF funding fully anticipated. And, and a small decline in students based on the calculation. So we had a negative 3.5 million in revenue. Um, the expenditures go up for second column by 3 million, the spirit of thirds, um, the cost of 2% for CSCA where um, those are being held. And then the, a few teachers, we had a technology project that was completed and surplus in the prior year. So this slide is what we saw in December, and we were looking at a 2.9 million structural deficit for next year. However, now with this new information from the governor, with the um, LCFF funding increase, instead we're looking at a 4.9 million increase to LCFF based funding. So we went from a deficit to a 5.5 million positive. On to the next slide. Okay, just now, clarifying, Jacob, yeah. just clarifying that that's if this proposal passes as is. So for, um, so again, we're still using information in the 2021 first interim. Now we're looking at another year out. This is 22-23. Information already presented to the board. Um, save information, just different numbers. Um, with a 16.6 million structural deficit. This is the um, this is the year of the um, where we lose our, our funding revenue based on the on students. So if we move to the next slide, now based on the governor's proposal, the revenue loss is not as high. There's still a loss, it's 3.8 million, but it's not as much. Also we had a surplus from the year before that if we hold on to then we only have a 4.1 structural deficit and instead of that, that larger amount. So it's still a structural deficit, but something definitely much more um, manageable. And then this is just a reminder of the other reductions that we've made um, this year and the last two years in order to keep our budget fiscally sound. So then on the last slide for this section, 
is our next steps. We are currently um, meeting with elementary school sites and principals, um, doing staffing meetings for the 21-22 staffing. Elementary this year, secondary um, this week, <laughs> secondary next week. So um, then we're going to um, incorporate this these proposals into our multi-year projections for the second interim budget that we bring to the board in March. We're gonna obtain site and department details of budgets for next year. Incorporation of um, the LCAP, again, this is for, for next year. And then from May, there'll be an update from the governor. So then we'll update the budget based on um, any changes from what was proposed in January, and ultimately the 21-22 budget will be brought to the fore in June. Kate, before you leave this, um, I see that there's a line item here, um, obtaining sites and departments detailed budgets. Is that something that the board will be able to look at? So um, every year, um, what we do is um, we create reports um, for each department and school site. Here's your current year budget. Here's your current year expenditures. Here's your allocation for next year. And now, now based on your allocation, please tell us where you're going to budget at. And so where they ultimately end up budgeting at, all that information is in the meritorious budget so okay. you can see that for uh, 2021, it's kind of in the center um, by department and, and by school. Thank you. You're welcome. So the next few slides um, is about developing the budget. It's a little bit more detailed. Um, it's, it's there for you to um, review if you like. But we are going to slide through to the, um, the next big bold blue screen is planning, goal setting, and financial policies. And, and again, just reminding you, these are all the things we're taking into consideration when building the budget, but we're not gonna go into detail on that. So you can keep going to the next. Okay, we're gonna go to 79. So again, just a couple things to highlight. These are all for reference. You've seen this before. Um, you've seen the decline in enrollment. What you see here on the orange bar though is new information. It came to it earlier. It is our unduplicated count. So you can see that um, uh, as it goes up and down, that's a really important indicator for us and how we um, get our funding. And so this year, um, our unduplicated has actually risen to 91.5 percent. And then and just, Connor, just to add, um, you know, I know that number varies different from the other, but um, you know, for each year, there's an unduplicated percentage. The LCFF funding is based on an average of three years. So what we're funded on doesn't always match exactly what the unduplicated percentage is for that, for that year. Right, and so Connor, if you come to 83, we're gonna skip through the rest of the slides. Um, and as Kate already referred, this is just our revenue history, how much that we've gotten over the past years. You can see that we're slightly higher um, this, this past year, that is due to those one-time funds that have come in. Um, so again, just keeping in mind, um, uh, one-time funds with a decline enrollment is going to, um, you know, lead to good, good decision making um, as we go through the, the budget development process. I think with that, we can jump to 91 and get, finish up with a few multi-year projections. Um, so multi-year projections are, are, are key. You know, we start planning for the next year um, in October. We're three months in, <laughs> we're already planning, you know, for the next year. And really we're planning way before that through these multi-year projections, but detailed planning. 
starts in, in October. And we'll tell you the projections, um, you know, the cause of most district insolvencies can be traced to a bad financial decision made during prosperous times that can back to bite the district during lean financial times. So caution is key. And this kind of goes back to the reserves. Um, so some reminders in the multi-year projections that the assumptions as today's decisions then equals the budget projections as assumptions change. Um, the budget changes, you know, going from January revenue proposal to, to the May revise objective, the changes. Um, other key items don't use one ten dollars to justify for ongoing expenditures. Don't use future projected dollars for current year expenditures. You know, we always say a future re uh, recession is predicted, so if the, the timing is unknown, have good reserves. And then um, local environment, which we came out of for this year, um, you know, requires uh, contributions um, to programs like special ed that don't receive enough revenue funding. And as we talked about, it's and proposing increases um, every year it is another key item to, to monitor. Um, so on the next slide, um, this talks about, you know, um, we're actually required by law, maybe 1,200 to do multi-year projections. They need to be um, approved. Um, and that a district budget must demonstrate that it can meet its financial obligations both in the current fiscal year and the subsequent two years. And so just a reminder again, that your decisions made today affect um, today and tomorrow. So moving on to the next slide, um, you know, we looked at this, looked a little different, but same numbers, just um, this is the dark work services and what we use for projecting out the LCFF funding for 2023 is 1.28% increase and 2024 will be 1.64% increase. The next slide, we saw this one earlier too, um, you know, that um, we do anticipate things to be going down a little bit and not getting better. And in here, if um, you want in the back, there is the multi-year projections that they've already been seen at first term. So the very last piece of this is um, monitoring our budget. Um, it just really shows how sometimes we're working in three years at once. That's on page um, 101. And after that, we are back to you for any more conversations. Thank you, Mrs. Ingersoll. Um, I'm sorry, I thought you were, that was the last part. If you go to 103, Connor, it's just questions or, or any um, comments. Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, I apologize, but I, I wanted to ask Kate, what, I probably missed it, was there. What was our income from the lottery, the California lottery? We and do. Sec secondly, do we dispense that to all schools equally or do we spend it as they desire? Uh, so, um... But the lottery has two different pieces to it. It has an unrestricted. I've unrestricted. been told it's gone down. Is that true? Uh, no, no, it, it has not um, gone down. It's about 2% of, of our revenue. And um, the unrestricted is used towards um, teachers, and the restricted is used towards instructional materials. I just think you just salaries. Thank you, Kate. Any. Is that it, Kate? Yes. And Mr. Vice I wanted to follow up what Christine Jefferson said. <clears throat> I'm concerned about the declining enrollment. And if I'm uh, to understand the media, being a native of California, and you haul trucks, uh, a lot of our folks are leaving. And they're going to Texas, Idaho, Nevada, 
in Florida. And the U, U, this is a U-Haul truck statistics. It costs you a lot of money to rent one in California. They're trying to get their trucks back. That's part of the problem. And some are going to homeschool, charter schools, and the birth rate is down. So, um, Christine, that's, that's part of our problem we're facing right now. Yes, Thank yes you. it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Bastion. Trustee Sandoval, your mic is off. Did you have a question or comment? Oh, no, I, I'm sorry. I'm okay. Sorry. Any other questions or comments from the board? Yeah, I have one comment, Mr. Baker. Okay, go ahead, Trustee um, Fowler. Looking at this budget and looking at all the information that we've given and how everything is put together, um, <clears throat> there should be no question about anyone raising any issue about transparency. And it's also, I want to reference the fact that there should be no question as to why last meeting that we recognized the fiscal management people because of their, <clears throat> excuse me, the budget award. So I want to bring that up to your attention. This is exactly why they, re they received that, uh, that award. And I want to thank them very much because I know this is an awful lot of work. <clears throat> it's, it's not just real easy work, but it is great work. So I want to thank them. You're welcome. I love doing it. Thank you. Trustees Jefferson or Revis or Okara. Nope. All right. I think I got everybody. Thank you, Kate. You need a motion to adopt this? No, this is informational. Okay, perfect. And that was our last item on the agenda um, until the next regularly scheduled board meeting, which is February 9th. Everybody enjoy the rest of uh, January. And we will be back here on um, February 9th at 6 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Have Thank a good night. You. Thank you very much. Good night.